The very things that most of our postmodern Christians consider as unimportant having been highly influenced by our heterodox and deluded neighbors. We often forget that Christ was here on earth. He witnessed the social evils. He saw injustice and pain and suffering. Yet he lived a life of total silence until the 30th year of his life. He did this to teach us the most perfect way. We have forgotten his ways today, and we think we can make disciples by our fine sermons. Before we can make any disciples, he taught us that we need to take the plank out of our own eye before we can begin to instruct others. He also taught us to become the salt of the earth by disinfecting ourselves from the various illnesses that torment our soul. Indeed, our Lord has given us a number of different commandments that many of us marginal Christians have a tendency to overlook and oversimplify nowadays, like Learn from me, for I am meek and of a humble heart. Blessed are the poor in spirit, the humble, the meek, the merciful, the persecuted, the pure in heart. If, you're still, if we are still pestered by arrogance, anger, lust, greed, jealousy, we cannot be the salt of the earth. We cannot be missionaries because we have not healed ourselves. No, we cannot take the speck out of our brother's eye unless we take the plank out of our own eye. And St. Gregory the theologian correctly teaches that it is good to speak about God, but it is far better to purify yourself for God. And if St. If Isaac the Syrian is much more expressive when he writes, the one who purifies his heart and silences his passions is higher than the one who resurrects the dead. Now, I'm belaboring this point, forgive me, but there are theologians in very high places today who teach that the primary work of the bishop today is to preside over the divine liturgy, and that divine liturgy alone can perfect the members of the church. So we have ended up with Christians who transfer their bodies back and forth from the church every Sunday. And that's a good thing. And we taught them to take Holy Communion every Sunday, at least in the Greek Archdiocese. And now we have the two extremes. In Greece, people were taught to commune four times a year, and now in our Greek congregations, we have hundreds of people communing every week without any participation in the sacrament of the Holy Confession. And St. Nicholas Gavasilas tells us, the priest gives the holy gifts to all who approach, but Christ gives his body and blood to those who are properly prepared, to those worthy to participate. Now, no one is worthy. We know that. What makes us worthy, however, is the constant struggle, the constant state of repentance, the constant Kyrie Jesu Christe eleisome, the constant mentality and approach of the tax collector. The Divine Liturgy will be of little help to us if we don't make an honest effort to keep everything that Christ commanded. And he commanded us to keep our baptismal garments clean with constant repentance and holy confession. And he certainly did not praise the one who tried to enter his great banquet without a bridal garment. So this Sunday, our Holy Church will place St. John as a lamp on a hill, as a representative of its ascetic nature, which shows and spells out the journey of men to reach the likeness of Christ. 
the ascetic works of the saints and the ascetical experience of the saints characterize the nature and the character of the church. The earth of the church provides an arena, a stadium of virtues for those who are somewhat healthy in and body and soul therapy, infirmaries and hospitals for those who are injured. All this can be found in the medical journal of the church fathers. The climax, the ladder of St. John, has mesmerized, mesmerized not a few modern day psychologists and psychoanalysts who are flabbergasted by the mastery of detail and incredible insight of this sixth century monk. The latter of St. John, this masterpiece of patristic philology, consists of 30 different steps, which I believe is, it is an expand, my opinion, it is an expanded version of St. Paul's nine fruits of the Holy Spirit. In the fifth chapter of Galatians, St. Paul begins with the highest virtues or fruits and he descends. He starts from the perfect gift which is love and he descends to abstinence. St. John begins from the low rungs of the ladder and climbs upward. He also includes the vices which St. Paul states right before the virtues. So he starts with renunciation of the world, detachment, and a general exodus. Of course, we may think, well, he wrote specifically for monks. Yes, it is certainly the beloved book of the monks, but according to Metropolitan Philaret, the latter was always favor reading in Russia for anyone zealous to live piously, though he were not a monk. All Christians are commanded to renounce the world to a point, not just monks. St. John, the ego of theology, cries out, do not love the world or anything in the world. The second step talks about detachment. The third step about an exodus. This exodus can be literal for the monastics who left to go to the desert, but it is also a commandment for every Christian soul. Christ says, I believe in Corinthians, come out of her, my people, and do not touch anything unclean, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. So all Christians must abandon the secular lifestyle. Renunciation, detachment, exodus from secularism. St. Paul calls all this abstinence, self-control, fasting. And as we increase the level of our struggle, then the level of patience, perseverance, and humility increases because all the virtues are linked together. And yet, many of our Christians today, clergy and lady alike, downplay the importance of fasting as something secondary. Oh, they may comment that fasting is something objective and certainly not as important as church attendance or Bible studies or missions or philanthropy or church programs. It is very interesting that when a mother approach yours and our beloved saint, Seraphim of Seraph, about how she might arrange the best possible marriage for her young daughter, he did not say, find her a theologian or a priest or a doctor or someone who goes to church every Sunday and takes Holy Communion. The great saint of the Russian church and the Orthodox church as a whole answered, with the experiential knowledge of the apostles, the martyrs, the prophets, and all the saints. And I quote the saint Seraphim, Before all else, ensure that he whom your daughter chooses as a companion for life 
keeps all the fasts. If he does not, then he's not a Christian, whatever he may consider himself to be. My dear fathers, many of our modernist priests and bishops may laugh at this. Those who eat fish on Fridays and limit the Great Lent uh, fast to the first and the last week, they may find this message as a message uh, of judgmentalism. They will consider this. How can you judge Christians who cannot fast? But the saint is not judging. The saint is speaking through the Holy Spirit. He knows the conscience of the church. Someone who's healthy and has no good reason not to fast is not an alive member of the church. He's a dead member of the vine, whether a lay person or a deacon or a priest or a bishop. This is the conscience of the church. Fasting is the door of all virtues, and it cultivates the conscience that we are members of one body with Christ being the head. And the members of the body of Christ are fasting this period. This obedience to the church is highly therapeutic. It is the slow detachment from our own will, our own desires. It is the beginning of meekness and humility. Saint Seraphim spoke like this because he was well aware that the church has plenty of martyrs, much like the seven Maccabees of the Old Testament, who chose to rather die than to violate the law of God and their Christian faith. We have many incidents where the idolaters knew that the Christians fasted this period and they pressure them to violate the fast. They refuse to break the fast, not because there's anything wrong with a piece of meat or fish or cheese. All these are wonderful and provided by God. But as Christians, we sanctify matter. We sanctify these food groups by offering them as obedience to God first. It is not as simple as we think. Fasting is not simple at all. By breaking the fast, we separate ourselves from the body of Christ. This was precisely the argument of one of our Greek neo-martyrs, St. John of Manemvasia, who was commanded by his Muslim Turk master to eat meat during the August fast. The martyr gave this most theological response to the Turk. How can I possibly eat meat when I know that this will separate me from the body of the faithful? God forbid. So he chose to die a slow, painful death after being pierced a number of times by the sword of his godly, of his godless rather, earthly master. So our saints began this seemingly unimportant tradition of fasting. They saw the virtue of obedience to the church. They saw it as the first commandment of God. Adam failed at this first commandment. Now the new Adam comes to repair and fulfill the shortcomings of the old Adam. And before he started his earthly ministry, he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights to repair the disobedience of Adam. And this does not seem impossible even for today's standards. About 20 years ago, there was a Russian priest monk, Father Seraphim, on Mount Athos, who could fast for 33 and sometimes 36 days straight without any food at all. So fasting is an indispensable part of the therapeutic discipline of the church, a proven prescription for a number of passions and spiritual illnesses. The person who fasts attacks first and foremost the passion of philophtia, philo in Greek means love, the excessive love of our well-being, the love of comfort, the excessive care and love for one's body, the obsession of self-preservation to protect our body, not to go hungry, not to become ill. This excessive attachment on the body and on the self gives birth to all kinds of phobias and cowardice, the fear of death, 
the fear of disease, the fear of H1N1, swine flu, and nowadays some people do not take Holy Communion because of this fear, the fear of uh, attracting some kind of illness from the Communion cup, and of course this is a great lack of faith and a great sin. And many mothers today may be afraid that their children will become ill if they fast. On the contrary, the experience of our church shows that the children are safeguarded and immunized by this godly fast against all kinds of dangers like substance abuse, cigarette smoking, and all kinds of dangers that will tempt them along their teenage years. Fasting strengthens the willpower of the child. A child that keeps the fast will have no difficulty saying no to cigarettes and other vices. Fasting galvanizes our faith and trust in God. The 102-year-old great Greek bishop Augustinos Gandiotis, whom I had the pleasure to meet a number of occasions, he used to repeat nistevis otan pistevis, that rhymes in Greek, but to fast, you must believe. A person that fasts learns to transfer his hope and his trust from the material world to God. We don't stay alive because of the things that enter our stomach. Our giver of life is God and not the neighborhood grocery store. So we learn to transfer our hope from the fruits of the earth to the fruits of the Holy Spirit. We begin to free ourselves from the attachments that enslave us by practicing the virtue of abstinence and fasting, which is the beginning of detachment of St. John of the Latter. Christ practiced this to perfection without not owning anything in this world. And the monks who imitate the life of Christ and the apostles vowed to actimosini, translated as poverty by the Western monks, but the Greek word literally means propertylessness or non-possessiveness. And that's the subject of, of step 17, which implies a total renunciation and detachment from objects, careers, technology, opinions, and so on. So fasting is the beginning of detachment and the prescription against greed. And greed is the root of all evil, according to St. Paul, because it enslaves people's heart. Wealth can be a blessing if it is used properly and for the glory of God. But it's very dangerous because more often than not, it robs man's trust and hope in God and it transfers it to gold and silver and the lifeless materials of the world. So the virtue of fasting is a great prescription against the fear of poverty, the loss of a job, especially in this unstable economy. Fasting develops courage and bravery and makes a Christian adamant in his resolve to be victorious because he has learned to rely on God and not on his unstable environment. Cowardice, according to St. Isaac, is the offspring of lack of faith, and the lack of faith is the mother of hell. Cowardice is a great passion of the soul, and the cowards cannot have a relationship with God, as we are plainly told in the final chapters of the book of the Revelation. In the Yerondikon, the writings of the Desert Fathers, some young monks visit a famous starts, and they ask him for a word. Elder, give us a word. And this man, give us a word to aid us in our salvation. A word of the Holy Spirit, that is. And the elder said, E echiscardian dinase sothisete. If you have a heart, you can be saved. What does that mean? If you have a heart, if you're not afraid. And once you begin to fear God, then all other fears will vanish. 
Another attribute of fasting is the virtue of obedience. Obedience to the Mother Church and disobedience to my sinful bodily desires. Obedience to God's commandments. Obedience is the fourth step in the spiritual ascent of St. John. Obedience is the tomb of the will and the resurrection of humility, St. John says. And this is so profound. Unless we are willing to sacrifice our own will, we will go to our grave with a stench of egoism and arrogance, the very characteristics of demons. So fasting and the general keeping of all the commandments are not an end to themselves. They were of no help to the Pharisee. They are tools by which we will put to death our sinful members so we can resurrect inside of us the life of Christ, the life of meekness and humility. Christ revealed to us the content of his heart. The content of his heart is full of meekness and humility. The content of the devil's existence is arrogance and pride. The devil fasts, he keeps vigil, he never sleeps, he always works, he never eats, but he can never obey and he can certainly never humble himself as he told St. Makarios in Egypt. Once again, the main purpose of all the detachment and abstinence and fasting is to free us and to make us truly free, to make us masters of our belongings and masters, masters of our thoughts. As we practice obedience, renunciation of the things that possess us, the sacrifice of our own will, then the natural result is meekness. St. Paul, who begins his ladder of ascent from the bottom, he starts with abstinence and then meekness and then faith in Galatians 5.22. Meekness is a fruit of the Holy Spirit and the meek person is truly liberated from his egotistical opinions, ideas, taboos, abstinence and self-control leads to humility and lack of anger. The humble and meek person does not rant and rave. He has full respect for people's opinions and positions. And St. John does very well when he places this virtue in the eighth step and calls it freedom from anger. St. John advises, the beginning of freedom from anger is silence of the lips when the heart is agitated. So, when we find ourselves fuming inside, when we light up, then we try not to express our feelings, contrary to modern psychology. We don't express our feelings at that moment. We bite our tongue. We hold it inside. Freedom from anger is victory over nature and insensibility to insults acquired by struggles and sweat. And this according to St. John the Sinite. It takes a great deal of daily struggle to tame inside of us the beast of anger, which is the offspring of pride. The meek and the humble person does not become angry. The proud person usually lights up at the slightest provocation. Freedom from anger is an insatiable appetite for dishonor, just as in the vainglorious there is, there is an unbounded desire for praise, according to St. John of the Latter. So the meek Christian is a very wholesome, very complete human being in all his actions. He will speak his mind, he will express his opinion freely and clearly, but he will not demand that his views must be accepted. Christ did not compel people to believe. He did not use force. He spoke, he enlightened, he clarified things, but he never demanded blind obedience from his followers, like some of the horror stories we hear today about some priests who present themselves 
as accomplished spiritual fathers. When a late person expressed the desire to go elsewhere, his spiritual father told him, Listen, my friend, one does not get away from me so easily, you know. Nonsense. Christ expressed absolute freedom in his relation with people. If anyone wants to, they can follow me if you want to. The father, the father in the parable of the prodigal son allowed his son to leave knowing in advance that he would destroy himself. As Christians, we need to avoid all fanaticism and we cannot use our position as priests or parents or as teachers to bound the freedom of those around us. We will suggest, advise, plead, but the final decision about how a person wants to live their life is up to them. We may not agree, but we will not become manipulative and over controlling after a person has reached adulthood. If people do not understand us, we don't pester them on a daily basis. Christ is our absolute teacher. Pilate asked Christ a question or two. Christ knew in advance that Pilate was not ready to even begin to understand theology. He had other things on his mind. So Christ kept silence. The quality or virtue rather of meekness is often misunderstood by the average Christian. It is generally believed that a meek person is spineless, opinionless, indifferent. This could not be farther from the truth. The meek Christian is certainly not spineless. On the contrary, the model of meekness, our Saint Nicholas, did not stay indifferent at the first ecumenical council. He smacked Arius and he was jailed by Constantine the Great. And Christ and the Most Holy Theotokos, the Virgin Mary, were not so displeased by his action. Otherwise, they would not visit him in jail and give, them, uh, give him rewards. So the meek, the humble person, is a whole complete personality. He can become a rug to be stepped on, but he can also become a granite in matters of faith. He can become a lion. In the Old Testament, there's a verse that the meek will become a warrior, a great fighter. In matters of faith, the meek person, who is usually careful not to harm an ant, in matters of faith, he will become as hard as a granite, regardless of the consequences. We have many examples in the life of St. John the Chrysostom, with Evdoxia, the Empress, and St. Basil, with uh, those of the palace. They were almost bodiless. They were not healthy from the constant uh, struggle and fasting and asceticism. Their health was terrible. But their soul was like granite, and their resolve was formidable to the wrongdoers and their opponents. A meek person is a person of total balance. He does not overreact or underreact. He's led by the Holy Spirit. He's the man of harmony.